If you have a Bible, love for you to open up to the book of 1 Timothy. It's a New Testament letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a protege by the name of, Tim yeah, Timothy. That's why it's called that. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you're new to Coastline or um, maybe learning about the churches that identify as Calvary Chapel and Fellowship, it's really a, a rhythm of ours to go through books of the Bible on Sunday morning in a way in which we just kind of read through the text and allow the text to be that which determines our takeaways, our applications, our doctrines. Uh, not for us to determine what the text says, but to discover as we go through it. And um, this may be too much information, but that's okay. Um, we really embrace, this is some words that you're like, why am I learning about this in the morning? Kind of a historical, grammatical approach to understanding the Bible. Meaning, when it was written, in the language that it was written, and in the time that it was written, to the people that it was written, that's where the meaning comes from. So it can't mean to us what it didn't mean to them. And for us, although the Bible wasn't necessarily written to us, like I'm not, my name's not Timothy, this letter wasn't written to me, but it is for us. Does that make sense? And so that really helps us stay kind of grounded and guarded and guided in a way. I mean, I've met like serial Christians. Have you ever met them? You ever, you know, serial, like cereals full of fruits, flakes, and nuts. Some people go, that's Christians, man. Like sometimes just reading the Bible that way helps. And there's still fruits, flakes, and nuts. There's one on the stage. There's some in the seats. But um, this helps just when you have, and that's called a historical grammatical hermeneutic, a way of understanding the Bible. Not sure why I'm telling you this. I didn't tell the other people this, but that's what we're doing. Now, um, we are encouraged and exhorted to hold fast through this book. Hold fast is a theme, a perspective, kind of a paradigm through which we're reading through 1 Timothy in this setting. And the phrase, the term, is actually nautical in its origins. If you were to use it as a verb, this idea of hold fast, it would mean to stay, stay the course, bear down, continue. Or maybe like a synonym, what would it? stay strong, do what is right, see it through, no surrender, grit it out. For a sailor, right, it has nautical orange origins. It wasn't a suggestion. It would have been this like exhortive call and order that if something were happening, a storm, something unexpected, they're in a battle, and there's certain times where, hey, complacency isn't the attitude we need right now. We need you to hold fast. Maybe there's other times where complacency is okay. Hey, it's just smooth sailing, you know? Take a nap. Maybe that would be the phrase. But, like, but there are times where you have to go, no, wait a second. There's a storm, or there's a dynamic, or there's an iceberg. Or what? Hold fast. Hold fast. It was this idea to grip onto something secure to avoid being swept overboard or losing your stability. Let me share something with you. It is easy in life to feel swept overboard by your schedule, by the opinions of others, by your own lack of clarity of what has the greatest ROI in life. And you feel like you're always like this. What should I be investing time in? Timothy was the protege, disciple, learner, friend, guy that's trying to learn from, Paul. And Timothy faced a storm. He was in a place called Ephesus. I had the privilege, not the right, but I had the privilege to be in Ephesus in January of this year. Walked the streets learned a bunch of stuff, saw a bunch of things, saw where the Nike signal came from. Pretty interesting. But Ephesus is a large ruin that is still very much intact. And in that city and at that time, Timothy wouldn't have been like the pastor of one congregation, but the lead guy for many congregations in that city. Out of necessity, they would have met in homes and smaller gathering places 
And Timothy was tasked to help other individuals, elders, like, okay, there you are. You're kind of smart, mature, and somewhat sane. Help, help that group. Like, you're, you're mature. you got a shepherding ability. You can oversee. Take care of those people. And if there's anyone that can help, like, let them deacon, serve. And Timothy was tasked to kind of keep that situation governed, guided, and guarded. It was tough. If you remember from last, last Sunday in verses 3 through 7, one of the things that Paul encouraged Timothy to do was to hold fast to the timing of God in his life. You can look at it there in verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Hey, Timothy, you stay right where you are. Don't leave. Don't leave. Most church historians would tell you that it, you can infer that Timothy didn't just wake up on a Monday going, man, the beach would be better. Maybe I'll go. No, it was like this nagging sense of like, I got to get out of this zip code. I hate it here. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But that was Timothy's Tuesday, his Thursday, his Saturday. He just wanted to be done. Maybe you're that way with a relationship that you know you're supposed to invest in, but it's hard because of what he did or what she didn't do. And the Lord would say, I want you to stay. Timothy felt like that. He felt like bailing out. It was hard where Timothy was. See, he was facing a storm, and this was the storm, misinformation, distortion, assumption, misunderstanding of the truth. Do you know anything about that in the 21st century? Are you alive? Yeah. That's constant, consistent, it's never going away. And so Timothy is, is, is instructed, is exhorted, hold fast, guard against false teaching, and commit to growing in your integrity and your leadership. There's three cords that are woven constantly throughout these chapters in 1 Timothy, and they have everything to do with integrity, leadership, and truth. If you were to say, what is he telling him to hold fast to? Obviously, Jesus. Like, that's the main point. But what's the, like, you know, not the meta narrative, but the minor narrative, if you can use that word? It's hold fast to truth, hold fast to integrity. And Timothy, be and surround yourself with godly leadership. I feel like those lessons are applicable to, to October 27th, 2024. Surround yourself with people that are leaders, not losers. Surround yourself with people that are, are listening to God, not lame. Surround yourself with people that are moving forward and encouraging you to do the same, not dragging you down. Integrity, be one person. Let the language on the golf course be the same language in the foyer at the church. See what that looks like. That'd be great. Just be one person. And hold on to truth. Truth. Those three lessons are interwoven throughout the chapters of 1 Timothy. Now, today, we'll just look at verses, um, verses 12 through 20. And we're going to look at four things specifically that really do pair with those major three of things that Paul encourages, exhorts Timothy to hold fast to. We're going to look at one in verses 12 through 17, and I'd like to read those verses in their entirety. But as we do that, though, can we stand together? Just out of respect for the inerrancy, the infallibility, the inspiration of God's word, and it helps wake up a little bit. You know, you could already be asleep. Like, nope, sorry, you got to wake up. Um, Verse 12 through 17, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. We'll also have it up on the screen. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, he says, I persecuted his people, but God... He says, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. 
In verse 15, it's like after, after Paul remembers who he was, looks back on the last few years of his life, it's like he's like, I'm going to write a song. That's almost what this is like. It's like, this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them all, he says. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. That's what he says. Father, we pray that these truths would form and fashion our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our choices, our worship, our work ethic, the way that we love our spouses, the way that we raise our children, the way that we serve our community. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hold fast. Here's the first takeaway truth today. Hold fast. Hold fast to what? Hold fast to Jesus. See, as you're, as you're reading that text, you need to remember that verses 12 through 17 come after verses 8 through 11. That's normal. Paul, in those verses, talks about the law, and he says, the law is good if it's used correctly, but listen to me, don't miss this. The law is not for righteousness. One of my mentors said, Neil, be careful that you don't take the New Testament and turn it into the new law. Just do, 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 and then you're good, good, good. Do, 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 and then you're good, good, good. No, no, no. It's been done. That's what makes you good, Jesus. See, Romans chapter 3 would say this, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. It's not how this works, outside in. No, it works inside out. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Have you ever awoken too early? Like your alarm was set and you woke up a little bit earlier and you go in the bathroom and then there's a mirror and a light and you look at that mirror when you've woken up too early, and you go, that's a bummer. You know, you just look at yourself, and you're like, well, it's not what it should be. But that's what the law is. The law is a mirror. Here's who you are. Oh, bummer. That's who I am. It shows me who I am. And I think we must be reminded every day that it's Jesus who saves us. Jesus. Even in the Old Testament sacrificial system, it was the lamb that was inspected, not the person that brought the lamb. And the perfection of the lamb was that which was evaluated for the sufficiency of the sacrifice. So on your behalf, Jesus is inspected. See, in life, it's not about what you know. It's about who you know, both temporally and eternally. You get in because you're like, hey, the lamb was inspected on my behalf, and he's really good. And so I, I'm allowed to come in because of him. See, when you hold fast to Jesus, I, I'm, I'm forgiven. It changes Monday. Like when you let this settle into your soul, Jesus, he has forgiven me. I'm holding fast to Jesus, because see, listen, we must be reminded every day that without Jesus, I have this friend that lives in Central Florida. He's a first-generation Christian in his family. His wife isn't. His wife's dad got saved. And his, his, her dad was kind of a big deal in the surf industry back in the 70s and 80s, was a CFO for some of these emerging companies. That now you can get at Sam's, but like they were at that time, they were they were cool. But like, um, and he has these sons, and the, these sons all grew up in church, kind of like me. I grew up in church. And I remember talking to this guy, this friend of mine, 
I said, hey, your sons are like contributing members to society. They're like all in their 20s. They're married. They have kids. They're like doing good things. I have kids. I want to do that too. How, how, how does that happen? Did they always do that? He goes, oh, no. My oldest didn't even get saved until he was almost like 18 or 19. I was like, what? But you're a, you're a pastor. Like you have this. What do you, what do you mean? He said, no, it took a minute for my kids to understand something, that there's a denominator in their life over every equation that's consistent, and that's the reason that they experience good things. And because that's their culture, it's hard for them to see it until they don't see it. I, I, that's too intense for me. I don't know what you're saying. He said, okay, basically, here's what I'm trying to say. They know Pop Pop as a very kind man. He's not. He's not until he met Jesus. See, he met Jesus in the 70s and then raised, this is my friend speaking, my wife, his daughter, at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. She went to the schools there. Um, that's where they, they just grew up in that culture. And my wife knows her dad as a very kind man, but not her mom. She knows him for who he is. Like, you ever seen that uh, TV show, Duck Dynasty? You know what that is? There's like a movie, something about the blind, or I forget what it's called. There's like a new movie that came out that's about the, you know, the dad's life who was far from God and then came to God. I watched one of those reruns of that show recently when the mom and dad, the patriarch and the matriarch of the family are renewing their wedding vows. And the wife says something in the vows that are so interesting. She says something to the effect I've loved you when you were used to be not so nice, and now you're very nice. And he talks about in a book, in a movie, throughout the show, that it's Jesus that changed things. And it's the same that's true for my friend. He told his older son when he was rebellious, when he was going through some stuff, he said, listen, you don't get something. The only reason you have anything good in your life is because of Jesus. He said, apart from Jesus, let me show you who my brothers and sisters are. They are not Christians. Let me tell you about Pop Pop before he met Jesus. See, and that resonated with me because I'm a part of a family where my dad and his brothers and others were like first generation Christians. And my dad's not perfect, but he is not terrible. Like he's a good, I, I think he's a good guy. Um, he's not perfect, but I mean like he's definitely become a Christian. Um, he's definitely being sanctified. And it's easy to forget what you have when you've always had it. See, I grew up in a good home, and I have so many good things that have happened in my life. Opportunities, education, mentors, travel experiences, things that I do not deserve, that are privileges, not rights. And the denominator is Jesus, is Jesus. Did you know that everything that's still good in this world is here because of God? What hell will be will be the absence of God. Light, love, peace, kindness. Every good and every perfect gift, the half-brother of Jesus would say, comes from God. And here's what I'm trying to share with you. No matter where we've been, what we've done, Jesus still avails himself to you right now. You're unfaithful to your spouse. Jesus says, I'm still here. You flew off the handle with your kids. Hey, I'm still here. You blew it again. Hey, I'm still here. See, I think we should hold fast to Jesus every single day. We need to remember Paul uses himself as an example. Listen, I was the worst, he says. I was, a, I was a Christian killer. I was prideful. Don't you love people that are climbing some sort of ladder, whether it's, you know, work-related or socially related, and they're just going to step on you to get to that next person? Don't you love people like that? Like, that's, that's Saul, climbing the ladder religiously, killing anyone that's in his way. Literally, in some capacities, all about himself, prideful, arrogant. 
And here's what he says. Listen, if, if, if God can reach me, because I was religious, those are some of the hardest people to reach, the religious. Hardest people to reach. Because it's exterior, but inward. And that's what matters, is what's in here. Paul says, if, if, if the grace of God, if the salvation that comes to us from God through the gift of Jesus can reach me, it can reach anyone. That's why he says, this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I was the worst of them all. Paul knew that the grace of God, salvation to us from God, the gift of Jesus. Let me put it this way. Because he goes on to talk about the salvation that didn't just have the impact upon his life to save him from his past, but to also equip him and empower him for his future. He knew that salvation is a bit like bread. Forgiveness. How many of you guys are thankful to be forgiven in Jesus? Okay, that's good. This back section, they don't care. But everyone else over here is like, man, forgiveness, I love it. But like forgiveness, salvation, salvation is like a loaf of bread. Forgiveness is just like the first slice. And it's, it's good. Like when you know that you're forgiven, man, that's good. Because I know who I was. I was lost. I was rebellious, I was angry, I was bitter, I was hurt, but I'm forgiven. Like, you know that, you're like, man, that's good. Now, though, I got to go make money. And now, though, I know that if it could just get to this situation politically, socioeconomically, relationally, man, that would really, 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 really satisfy. So what most of us do is we go, man, salvation, man, I'm forgiven. Mmm, going to eat that piece. But, man, I need, like, purpose. Athletics gives me that. Academics gives me that. Art gives me that. Maybe I could apprentice somewhere. Maybe that'll give me purpose. But you know, maybe not that, maybe it's community. I need some kind of crew to connect with. Dungeons and Dragons, that's my crew. Or like, whatever the crew, I need some, I'm a cyclist, let me find my people. I need like some kind of community, I need some kind of purpose, I need to know what it's like to be pursued in love. You ever heard of a pop song? Like, that's what they talk about. And so you treat salvation just like this. Man, I got that peace, forgiveness. This is what I would tell you. This is what a professor of mine once told me. Neil, salvation is like a loaf of bread. Forgiveness is just the first slice. You see, you're meant to be free. That's what salvation does. Free. Do you know what it's like to be free from your temper? To where when something happens, you're able to go, hey, I don't have to fly off the handle here. Do you know what it's like to be free from any kind of addiction that has plagued you. Go, man, it's late, there's the internet. I don't have to. Do you know what it's like to be free from criticism? Where you meet someone and you don't have to size them up. You don't have to question their motives. You don't always have to think they've got some sort of agenda. See, that's bondage. Someone once asked me, Neil, are you free? And I think the response was like, I don't, what does that mean? He goes, no, you're not. A free person wouldn't have to ask. So I ask you that question. Are you free? Does bitterness still have a hold? Guilt? I met somebody the other day who's a Christian. We're of a different race. And he said, wherever I go, I don't measure up, man. So I always got to be better, always got to smile, always got to, because I know I'm never going to be good enough. Oh, man, that's, that's bondage. I hate that for you. See, salvation is like a loaf of bread. Forgiveness is first slice. What's second? Freedom. Being brought into the family of God that's very diverse. Understanding who God has made you to be, like your family background the gifts, the talents, the abilities he's placed in you, that you have a dynamic calling upon your life. We share a static one. Read Matthew 28 and Mark 16. But there's also dynamics where you're gifted differently. 
You're unique. And God has something that he wants you to do. Like I've known Lacey for probably, I don't know how long, what, maybe four years? If I have Chris. Chris is like this amazing person. He used to work with the Blue Angels, and now he's like a pilot. Lacey, she used to work at the shop with us. Let me ask a question. And this is, uh, they don't even know I was going to ask this. I just was going to see whoever I knew and ask a question. So here we go. I know you. Like, would you say that you are exactly the same in all of your gifts, talents, and abilities? Like, there's not one thing that the, oh, yeah, you're already shaking your head. You're like, no way. So what's one thing, Chris, that you would say, like, hey, I, God's gifted Lacey to do this well. It could be, like, she really makes a great meatloaf. Okay, wonderful. But, like, what is one thing that you go, you know, when I, I've known Lacey for a while. God's really gifted her to do this. What's one thing you would say? What's one of her strengths? Personality. She's got a great... Okay, Lacey, what's one strength that's maybe different from yours that you would say, Chris, he's like this? His work ethic. Okay. The greatest way to develop strength and growth is collaborative tension. Oh, that's how we grow. Nobody likes collaborative tension. Nobody likes tension. But that's how you grow. And when you're in a family or in a marriage or in a business and you're like, "Ah, that person irks me because they have a better work ethic or whatever this thing, or they, we won't say, you're not saying this, I'm playing with your words. They have a better personality. That's not what you said, but like, I don't want to start a marriage situation, but like, but do you see what I'm saying? Like, man, that person, they're an early riser and I like to sleep in. We should get divorced. No, you should like work it out. You're there to strengthen one another. You're there to develop one another. If you start to filter your decisions by what develops my character, not what keeps me comfortable, then you'll begin to grow. But your culture has duped you to believing that I deserve comfort. Like, it's a, I should have it. Now, I, I like air conditioning. I'm not saying we should suffer at the, for no reason. But I don't believe that God's primary desire for you is your comfort. I believe it's your growth. And sometimes he will allow things to be a little uncomfortable so that you will grow. And often... You begin to learn, wait, struggle is not my enemy. Struggle is my friend. Wait, pain. Pain's not my enemy. Pain is my notifier. This isn't healthy. Oh, pain's actually a friend. Martin Luther used to say, Affliction's the best book in my library. And here's what I'm trying to say Salvation's like a loaf of bread, forgiveness is just the first slice. But when you learn how to walk in freedom by the power of the Spirit of God, when you learn how to work things out in the family of God, even when there's tension, when you learn that you have a specific function to play in that family of God, welcome to the loaf of bread. See, everything else, salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, and sport, those are good things. But when you take a good thing and make it the God in your life, It ruins the thing that God intended it for. Salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, and sport are good things that God gave to you and I to gratify. It's a good thing to have sport, to have salary. Anyone thankful that you make money? I mean, like, yes, this has gotten very expensive. You know what I mean? Like, you're you're thankful. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you live for salary, if you live for sport or for situation, man, when the ideal and the real can just get closer You're not made for gratification. You are designed for satisfaction of soul. And that comes through a different S, a savior, Jesus. There it is. That's the bread that fills. Jesus. Jesus. So, church, hold fast to Jesus. See, Jesus doesn't just save us from our past, but he equips us and empowers us for our future. Please listen to me. October 27th, 2024, you're still here. There's a reason for it. It's not to consume. It's to contribute. Consumers are miserable people. Contributors are alive. See, verse 12, this is what he says. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's given me strength to do his work. He's considered me trustworthy and appointed me to entertain myself. No, to serve him, 
to serve him. You are designed to discover who God is, discern how he's gifted you, develop and then deploy. As a Christian, you realize that the gospel saves, that life becomes about God being number one and then growing as an individual or a family. Those are the three G's. Gospel, God, grow. Gospel, God, grow. Gospel, God, grow. Individual and family. And then you begin to awaken to something. I call it this. I call it the coastline life, if you want to put it this way. We'll go past this one real quick. The coastline life. It took me forever to figure this out. But we're about new life in Jesus. Have been ever since this Sunday 41 years ago. This is the first Sunday that New Life Christian Fellowship started, the last Sunday in October. Ever since then, that's always been our heartbeat. We're about seeing new life in Jesus. How does that happen? Believe the gospel. And if you don't get baptized, you can't get saved. No, but that's the way you proclaim it. Like that's your next step. Does that make sense? Like, oh, I believe the gospel. And then I just, I tell people, I wanna be baptized. It doesn't happen to you in this century, but in the first century, if you were a Christian and to be baptized in Jesus' name, you were signing a death warrant. Hey, Caesar isn't Lord, Jesus is. They're coming for you now. Christianity is not meant to be this secret. It's meant to be this public. The gospel brings life, Jesus. What's the gospel? Read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's the clearest description of what the gospel is in the Bible. And then profess him. But then life is going to start to look different, Romans 12, 1 through 2. After you get orthodoxy, Romans 1, 1 through 11. Chapter 12 is where orthodoxy turns to orthopraxy. Therefore, because of everything that this just said, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, be a living sacrifice. Gospel, God, grow. Individual and family. Then, as a church, gather, group, go. Gather to do what? To just say thank you. That's what a worship service is. God, we're here to sing to you because you're worthy. We're here to talk to you. We're here to remember the cross. We're here to listen and learn so that we can love, live, and lead like Jesus. We're here to give. We're here to serve. We're here to be in community. And I do that in a gathering and a group. If you just do one, you will begin to wobble. I, I gather to do these things, and then I group for dialogue. See, the purpose of a church is not that everyone knows everybody, but that everyone in the church can be known. And that happens in a group or a serve team. But a gathering for the preaching and teaching and singing and serving and giving and fellowshipping, it's a healthy thing. You can take it back to our ancient roots, Act chapter two. But see, you gather to love God, you group to connect together, and then that's gonna lead to like, we gotta help more people know about this. Mission exists because and where worship doesn't. Mission is not the goal, it's the vehicle. The goal is God, knowing him and helping others do the same. See, love connect mission. It's not just our purpose, it's our process. Gather, group, go are not just words that begin with the same letter. These are your handles. You want to live life to the fullest? Listen, spiritually, you can choose to be random or rhythmic. Anyone love it when things are random? No. You want rhythmic. There's nothing spiritual about random. But when you learn to live in rhythm, all right, good morning, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that I'm forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that I can get into your word and not just do it on my own, but with others. Thank you that this Sunday I can gather and I can actually give of my first fruits. I can actually serve others. When it's appropriate, I can take communion with others. When the sermon's being preached, I'm there to listen and learn so that I can love and live and lead. Not, see, if you don't listen and learn, a sermon just becomes something that's lame and you become loco and a loser, basically, or whatever. Like, it just doesn't really help you out. That's what Billy Graham said. The greatest sin in America is listening to a sermon. I listened. Well, big deal. Did it do anything? No, but I listened. What? No, no, no. 
how, how, how do you hold fast to Jesus? I think this. If you're like, give me a first step. Now we'll go to that slide. Well, come next Sunday. First steps. That's where we help you discover who God is and who Coastline Calvary Chapel is to determine the fit. They don't do this anymore. But when I was in high school, if a boy liked a girl or a girl liked a boy and they started hanging out and they would go to this place called the mall. Have you ever heard of one of those? Some of us heard that. Eventually, you'd have to DTR. Does anyone remember what DTR is? See, nobody talks about this anymore. Define the relationship. Because you could be hanging out, and you're like, okay, we went to a movie, and we got a smoothie. What does that mean? Or like, okay, we went to the mall, and she expected me to buy dinner. Why did she expect that? We need to define the relationship. Like, are we together? That's what First Steps is hopefully helpful for you. Hey, here's who Coastline is. You should know that we're a complementarian. Oh, what does that mean? Come and find out. You should know that we're what? Pre-trib millennialists. Like, whoa, what is that? Come find out. Because what happens is in a church, about six months, 12 months, 18 months in, they're like, I didn't know that they defined marriage as one man with one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. I thought it was something else. Be good for you to know that at the beginning, I guess. But get to know the church, our theology, our philosophy of ministry, our governance structure, our giving protocol, our vision, mission, and values. Discover who we are. And then discern how you're wired and gifted and see if it's a fit. Because it may not be. And here's the deal. That's okay. There's so many good churches in this community. I think more churches should exist because there's all different kinds of people. But at least for us... Let there be clarity. How do I hold fast to Jesus? The gospel. But as a community, gather group, go. Take a first step. But then he goes on to say, don't just hold fast to Jesus, but hold fast to faith. Look at verse 18 and 19. We're almost done. Don't worry. Like, gosh, three more points. What are we going to do? It's going to be okay. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. Based on the prophetic words spoken to you earlier, may they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith, he says. Number two, hold fast to faith. Faith can simply be defined as confidence, trust, a decided upon hope. Paul tells Tim, remember the call that came upon your life through prophecy. Let me read verse 18 from the Christian Standard Bible. It says, so that by recalling them, the prophetic words that were given to him, you may fight the good fight. The Christian life is this wonderful thing where you get to eat bread, so to speak. Like, man, I'm forgiven. And it's also a fight. It's hard. You don't drift into spiritual maturity. Faith is both a gift and a muscle that anchors us in times of doubt, temptation, and struggle. It's not just about believing God when things are easy. But man, life is hard. I've known Pastor Joe now for about 30 years. Yesterday, we we're at the Fall Fest, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but someone we know witnessed something traumatic where this individual is literally shaking. This isn't a 15-year-old girl, no offense if you're a 15-year-old girl, but it's like a 55-year-old man who's seen a lot of things in his life and was shaken. So in that moment, Joe and I process what's being shared with us. We pray with the individual. And the individual says, I needed to be here around God's people. Like, I needed my faith to be encouraged. Why? Because it's pretty difficult what he just witnessed. And when times are hard, that's when you need to hold fast to faith. I have a mentor who's 28 years older than me. In 1982, he and his wife were skiing, and they were in a car accident. He got thrown half a mile from the car, and she died upon impact. Left him with a 5-year-old, a 3-year-old, and a 1-year-old. 12 years later, his daughter, died on the same exact road. 
Recently, about five years ago, his son died. He's had a hard life. And I remember when he told me when Jesse died, his little girl, he said, Chuck Smith called me. And he said, don't exchange what you do know for what you don't know when you're going through difficult times. Why did Jesse? Why did Terry? Those questions lead nowhere, man. I remember hearing him give a sermon say, why not? If we really believe that heaven is better than this place, why wouldn't God go ahead and usher them into his presence? That's called perspective. That's called like believing this. That's called faith. Don't exchange certainty for when times are uncertain. See, Paul speaks of those who were made shipwreck. Did you see that in verse 20, 19? Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences, and as a result, their faith was shipwrecked. We're going to talk about that more in a second. But here's this reality. Paul speaks of those who made shipwreck of their faith because they didn't hold on. Think of faith as the ship that carries you through life. If you don't actively maintain it, if you're not in God's word, the pressures of this world will very quickly cause you to drift off course and worse, crash into rocks of doubt, fear, and sin. How do we hold fast to faith? I'm going to put this image up on a screen. This is my opinion. You want something super simple? Gather and group, gather and group, gather and group, and go and do those things. Live rhythmic, not random. Don't let athletics be the, the captain of your ship. Let Jesus. Don't let work. Don't let emotion. See, sometimes you have to put motion in and then emotion follows. You don't wait for emotion and then to put motion in. You'll never get anywhere. Welcome to sitting. Like you, you have to do something. God is this perfect gentleman when it comes to spiritual growth. He will organize life, in my opinion, in ways that give you opportunities to respond, but he won't force you. You have been given stewardship over your life. And I just want to share something with you. October 27th, 2024 wasn't given to all the people I've known, but it's been given to you. What are you doing with it? recreating. There's a place for that. But if you have breath, you have purpose. And I think it's more than just the next trip, the next game. Hold fast to Jesus, hold fast to faith, and then thirdly, hold fast to integrity. That's what he says in the second half of verse 19. Keep your conscience clear. The word integrity, some of the etymology of that is just the word integer. This isn't a math class, but integer just means like a number, like one. So be one, not Jekyll and Hyde, but you, you're just you. You're just you. Being the same per person in private and in public. One person said this, a good conscience is like a moral compass helps us navigate the decisions in life. When we live with integrity, when we do what's right, it gives us a clear conscience, and conscience leads to confidence. Paul warns that those who reject a good conscience, mean doing things they know they shouldn't do, are in danger of spiritual shipwreck. And does anyone have a daughter or a son named Hymenaeus? No, I don't. We know... Some people are named Alexander, but here's my point. We bet you don't know anybody named Lucifer other than the cat on Cinderella. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's some names that you're like, no, that name is not, not what you want. Like, I, I'd be bummed if I was Hymenaeus's mama. Man, he made it in the Bible, but look what, you, you spiritual shipwreck. That's why you're there. The point is, Hymenaeus and Alexander didn't start out saying, I can't wait to wreck my life. Nobody does. How do you end up there? Pretty simple. 
You just do one thing, like, ah, no big deal. Then it comes another thing, and another thing, and another thing. And then eventually, Gemini Cricket doesn't mean anything to you anymore. Like the conscience. You don't listen to him anymore. You gotta hold fast to integrity. I keep referencing Pastor Joe. In this season of our life, we're partnered in, a, in ministry where we navigate a lot of challenges, not between us, but others in the congregation. We were talking about a friend of ours, mutual, said, hey, how's so-and-so? He goes, the marriage. Said, oh, man. The life. The attitude. That's not even like that person. What's going on there? Well, they, and this was this situation. I'm not saying every situation. They stopped gathering. They stopped grouping. They kind of lost touch with people that knew them and could say, hey, maybe that's not a good idea. Like, Isolation is the attack of the enemy that can sometimes be wrapped with good intentions. Well, we're stepping away for this season because, all right, make sure it's a season. Make sure it has an end date. Seasons don't linger, they end. Aren't you thankful for that, for false fall? It ends. Oh, we got real fall. We don't know when that's coming. It keeps changing, but like, but seasons do end. We're called to hold fast. Why? Because... In your flesh, the world, the enemy, if you're not careful, that can be what energizes you. Remember, you don't drift into spiritual maturity. It's intentional. Hold fast to Jesus. Hold fast to faith. Hold fast to integrity. And then we'll close with this, verses 12 and 18. Let me read them to you from the Christian Standard Bible. Verse 12 says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me in the ministry. That sounds important. Verse 18, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight. There's a ministry. There's a fight. We're not here just to be forgiven and go, man, isn't God good? Hmm, I'm forgiven. Now let's go make money. Hmm, I'm forgiven. Who won last night? The Dodgers? No, I'm saying, okay, it's okay, you watch sports. But it, it gratifies, it doesn't satisfy. Don't you want something more than just constant gratification? Don't you want to know what it's like to be satisfied? We're not saved just to sit on the sidelines, but called to engage the world with the good news of Jesus. This is too much, but I'm going to share it one last time. How do we do that? Uh, like this. This is how you do it. Gospel, God, grow, individual and family. Community, gather, group, go. Because one day, you'll be gone. And it's going to happen faster than you think. And what you do daily becomes who you are in the aggregate. So just keep it simple and keep it biblical. I first discovered this in 2017. They made me discover it. Because I was in a master's degree program at that time where I had to read a bunch of books and write a bunch of papers. And I was like, I don't even really know what a church should be doing. I've been at church my whole life, but... It, if someone were to tell me, what's your vision, mission, values? I go, I don't know. I'm going to figure that out. But I don't care what I think. I know too much about me. I want to know what the Bible says. Amen. So what I discovered was, oh, it's about life. Secret of life is to live. Is that simple? Be right where you are. Uh, new life in Jesus. And then the great commandment and the great commission. That's what the church should be about. Love God, love people, make disciples. But then here comes the really nitty-gritty, how? Everyone says that. How? Gather, group, go. What do I do when I gather? Is it for the unsaved or the saved? Nope. It's for God. And the unsaved and saved benefit from it. This is about God, not about us. But man, I like it. I like worship gatherings. I think they're great. That's why I came. I like it. This is how you avoid spiritual shipwreck. Just, you know, walking with Jesus. 
Don't let fear or comfort or selfishness loosen our grip upon the goodness of God that we have in Jesus. See, here's what I just want to say as we close. I'll go ahead and invite the worship team up as they prepare to kind of close us out in a benediction. Holding fast to Jesus, every day just realize that nothing is ever going to separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Let yesterday die. It's over. Right now, celebrate that you can be forgiven in Jesus. ABC, admit that you need him, believe in him, and confess him as Lord. It's that simple.